eerie, isn't it? Like a set in one of those Hollywood space movies. No one's around. Back there is Silvertown. Straight ahead is Charlton. And up there is the River Thames. And I'm right inside the Thames Barrier. good day for Britain. A tremendous engineering project has been successfully accomplished. Parliament, Government and Greater London Council can be well pleased. I want to congratulate all those responsible for this great feat, for they have made a vital contribution to the safety of London. I have much pleasure in declaring the Thames Barrier operational. It's difficult to know where to start this story. In 1953, when London only just escaped being flooded. In 1968, when after persistent urging by the GLC, the government authorised the council to investigate the practicality of a flood barrier. Or in 1974, when construction of the barrier started. How many people who've actually lived and worked in these areas realise that one day, dear old Father Thames might destroy their lives? That's no exaggeration. One high tide in the middle of a blowy winter's night and all this lot can be flooded out. People who lived around here never believed that the river was an enemy, something to be feared and treated with caution and respect. After all, the river has always been a great highway. Plenty of traffic, the docks alive with activity. Ships queuing for a berth to be unloaded. Now, well, just look at it. When people talk about Dockland, this is what immediately comes to mind. Even today, people don't say much about the Thames flooding, and yet it's been getting progressively worse and more dangerous for years. Take 1928, for example. Fourteen people died then, and it wasn't the first time it had happened. Altogether, ten times in the last 80 years, the Thames has almost come over the top of its banks. There were plenty of ideas around for building some form of flood control, but somehow most of these schemes got pushed aside or forgotten. After all, the docks were at their busiest in those days, and nobody wanted to see a great obstacle in the river stopping the ships. Remember 1953? For some people, the coronation is still a vivid memory. Up 
Others may recall the famous Matthews Cup final. Yes, that was in 1953. But so was this. Canby Island suffered worst of all. When the protecting wall was breached, the water came swirling through in a tremendous torrent, smashing homes and sweeping all before it. The floods on the east coast of England. Lost, over a hundred disappeared in the first rush of the flood. London escaped the worst of it, but no one could ignore the warning. Something had to be done, quickly. But what? This interim report, produced by the Waverley Committee, was one of the first official responses to the East Coast floods. It dealt with the flood warning system along the coast, and there was no mention of any kind of Thames barrier in the nine-page report. Work started on building new defences along the east coast and raising the banks along the Thames. There was a lot of talk about building a barrier, but this only sent the designers back to their drawing boards to produce another set of ideas. Three schemes were outlined in 1961, but all were rejected for one reason or another. Financing any scheme was a major headache, so the years slipped by without anything really being achieved. In the mid-60s, rising prices showed few signs of slowing down. Everyone had to face that fact, including those who felt a barrier was critical if London was to escape a disaster. There was a lot of talk, a lot of good intentions, but still no master plan emerged to stop London from flooding. The government was so concerned about cutting costs that any chance of a flood protection scheme being given the go-ahead seemed fairly remote. During 1965, two things happened which were to prove very significant. In March, the Greater London Council took over from the London County Council. And at the end of that year, the Thames rose to within six inches of the flood defences in central London. There was extensive flooding upstream in the Richmond and Hounslow areas. It was also in 1965 that the government told Professor Bondi of King's College to look at the whole problem. Time was clearly running out. And this is it. The report that finally made everyone realise that despite the cost, a barrier of some sort must be designed and built soon. Yet it was two years before this report was published, and then only after a lot of prodding by the GLT. It was in this chamber that a motion was passed calling on the Ministry of Housing and Local Government to expedite the publication of their report on the feasibility of a permanent Thames barrage or retractable barrier in the Thames estuary in view of the considerable public anxiety as to the risk of extensive flooding. Eventually, the government gave the go-ahead and the GLC's first move was to engage consulting engineers to coordinate all investigations and designs for a flood barrier. The scale model of the Thames was built at the hydraulic research station Wallingford and the merits of 41 different schemes and six different sites were compared. The effect that a dam or barrier would have on the river was studied in detail, especially the problem of siltation if the ebb and flow was disturbed during peak tides. The chosen design for the barrier was classically simple. The engineers settled for a scheme that meant building a line of concrete piers across the river with movable gates between them. 
when the gates are in the defence position, the incoming tide is checked. Although the levels downstream continue to rise, the level upstream can be controlled. This was the chosen site at Woolwich before any work started. It had received a lot of prominence in the Bondi report. It had a fairly good approach for shipping. All vessels would be able to see the barrier well in advance and adjust their course. The bed of the river at this site had a solid chalk foundation and could support heavy loads. This very solidity, however, was to cause problems later on. Work started in 1974. It was to be finished in time for the 1979-80 winter. The forecasted cost, with associated bank raising work, was 171 million pounds. The reality proved quite different. There was a great deal of enthusiasm and optimism in those days, yet it was impossible to comprehend the enormity of the project. In the end, it took eight years to complete, instead of five, and the cost rose to a staggering 535 million pounds. Looking back, it's easy to see why the calculations proved wrong. In the mid-70s, the whole world was experiencing the oil crisis and the start of soaring inflation. It was sheer bad luck that after decades of discussion, work on such a vast and revolutionary engineering project should begin at a time of growing financial uncertainty. Over the years, three main factors added 365 million pounds to the final cost. Inflation, technical difficulties, and lower than expected productivity. So the final total was 535 million pounds. Of that, the government has met three quarters of the figure, the Greater London Council the rest. In those first two years, the pattern of work was as follows. On the southern shore, a large site was developed to house all the offices and construction equipment. An access jetty was built, which reached out from the southern side to the middle of the river. On the northern side, a vast temporary dry dock was needed. This area had to be sealed off and drained before work on the precast concrete sills could start. This meant that ships moving up and down river had to be diverted through a specially dredged channel between the construction work. There are nine piers stretching across the river. What you see above the surface of the water is only a third of the construction. The rest is hidden from view. To build each one meant creating a dry working area in the river, a coffer dam. A coffer dam is a prefabricated watertight box. In simple terms, it's like creating a hole in the river. A dry area where construction work can go ahead. To do this, Steel piles are driven into the bed of the river to form the walls of the dam. They must be able to withstand an enormous pressure of water from the outside. Once the walls of the dam are in position, then excavation can begin.